This is Dagestan, high in the Caucasus Mountains between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. From 1917 to 1991, Dagestan was part of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Dagestan became a semi-autonomous region of the new Russian Federation. I first came to Dagestan in 1994 to attend a conference on peaceful coexistence. This is a subject of vital concern here, for Dagestan was virtually surrounded by war. To the south, Azerbaijan fought Armenia. To the west, Abkhazia fought a secessionist war against Georgia. And to the north, tensions were rising in 1994 over Chechnya's attempt to secede from the Russian Federation. In Dagestan, however, a fragile peace was preserved. Though here too, as elsewhere in the Caucasus, the royal archetype predominates. Hussein, the peaceful warrior, is former coach of the Russian national karate team. Today he is director of a unique institution he and his wife Olga founded. It is a boarding school whose curriculum is centered on ethical values, fine arts, and martial arts. <laughs> We live in Dagestan, where people appreciate sports skills, especially in martial arts. That's why we work with martial arts as a foundation, because the philosophy of martial arts is basically peaceful. At this school, Gusein teaches the children of Dagestan to channel the energies of their warrior tradition into peaceful forms of artistic and athletic expression. Today, Dagestan is a country of contrasts. While Russian pipelines carry oil from Azerbaijan through Dagestan for export to the West, Dagestanis themselves often have trouble filling their tanks. There are huge dams and hydroelectric power plants. While along the lake below the dam, a traditional shepherd watches his sheep and goats and takes a moment to greet our camera. In the patriarchal culture of the Caucasus, most women lead a life of hard physical labor. I returned to Dagestan in August 1996. Between my 1994 and 1996 visits, a bloody war had raged between Russian troops and Chechen rebels. I asked several people what impact the war in Chechnya had on Dagestan. One of the persons I asked was a Thai. <laughs> You might recall during your last visit to Dagestan there was no war, but the feeling of danger was in the air. The situation then blew up in Chechnya. If Moscow seriously wanted to remove the bandit regime, the Dudayev regime, they should have prepared more carefully, but they were poorly prepared. They thought they could take Grozny in two hours. They took no account of anything. They could at least have known the history of the Caucasus, the history of the 19th century wars when Shamil resisted Tsarist Russian imperialism. Shamil, Dagestan's national hero, was the archetypal warrior. In the early 19th century, Shamil united the warring clans of the Caucasus under the banner of Islam to fight the infidel invaders from Tsarist Russia. Shamil turned mountain villages like these into fortified bastions capable of withstanding a Russian siege. 
To many observers, the current war between Russian troops and Chechen rebels was a familiar replay of the 19th century wars. Only this time it seemed the Russians might not be the winners. But I'm afraid that Chechnya and these guerrillas consider themselves winners because their position was considered by the highest levels of the Russian government. I don't know about the future, but at the moment the guerrillas are sure they've won. That's what they believe. Using this, they probably will try to reinforce the Islamic fundamentalist movement. Although Dagestan is multi-ethnic, 90% of the population is Muslim. Along the roads there are mosques and shrines. Devout Muslims attach a piece of cloth to a tree and petition Allah. Nadir, a prominent Dagestani figure, is head of the Union of Muslims of Russia. In summer 1996, he served as go-between bringing Russian General Alexander Lebed together with Chechen rebel leaders to negotiate a peace accord. After Alexander Lebed was named by Russian President Yeltsin as official representative to negotiate with Chechnya, Lebed phoned me. We met and consulted, after which he lent me his private plane. I flew to Chechnya and arranged a temporary ceasefire. After that I took Lebed in by plane, then along mountain trails at night to a secret meeting place. Nobody knew about it and our convoy was attacked by both sides. The meeting took place and an agreement was reached. I watched the announcement of the signing of the peace accord on Dagestani television. I asked Nadir if peace in Chechnya strengthened the Muslim cause. Sure, no doubt about it. We are called bandit formations. I say we because after the meeting with Lebed, I became the subject of a firestorm by the central mass media. They attacked us. They say we are criminal elements, mafiosi, and we don't like this. Our Islamic movement cannot feel safe and comfortable. In spite of our achievement of peace in Chechnya, we cannot even consider it a victory for Chechnya. As for us, we must call for jihad, because our culture and our spirituality are being destroyed. Our government has no ideology. People are lost, they start to drink alcohol to do violence, to become mafia men. While there is no war in Dagestan, every day people are being killed. There are fights between clans. And it's possible to fight against this only through jihad. And jihad is not such a terrible thing. It's not necessary to take out your sword and fight. There is a disciplined jihad based on the will. I attended a memorial service for an assassinated cabinet minister where a noted woman poet delivered one of the eulogies. Another woman Hapasat, former Minister of Communication, spoke proudly of the educational work being carried out at the martial arts boarding school run by Gusein and Olga Magomayev. It's an amazing thing, an amazing school. When I first met Gusein and Olga, I couldn't come down for a long time. I told everybody that in this immoral time, there are people who put education first, above their own profit. These people teach being kind to one another and to nature. To teach kindness, this is what the whole society should be doing. Young people often feel like calling someone names, slapping someone who is weaker, intimidating others and following the way of least resistance. A kid watches films and videos and has favorite heroes who fight ferociously and beat everybody and the child wants to imitate them when he's young. He seeks self-realization, and we must allow him to realize this. He needs to fight with others, but with limits and rules. You fight, but with judges and spectators around, and an opponent you must respect. This is very difficult to learn, because people often get into bloody sports. They want to maim and kill. This disappears with age as one's mastery increases. 
He kills nobody now. He no longer has mythical enemies he imagined were waiting for him around every corner. Practicing martial arts, he realizes these enemies are inside himself. These are the enemies against whom he should struggle. The boy learns peace. Through his fists and fighting, he learns how to achieve peace. This is the paradox of all Eastern martial arts. At their school, Gusain and his wife instill in Dagestan's youth peaceful conflict resolution skills that are vitally needed in this volatile region. For their work with children, Gusain and Olga receive little monetary reward, but as Hapasat put it, they receive much love and respect. If there is peace in Dagestan, and if the earth still exists, and if there is a reason for its existence, it's all because of such people who today think about the future, the future of all humanity. <laughs>